My name is Scott Smith. I work for WIT. We are your host today. I want to thank everybody for coming out. For the folks that are here for the first time, welcome. And for the folks that are here from a previous time, welcome back. Tight agenda today, and uh, I'm just going to be up here for just a couple minutes before I hand off to our keynote. So just a shameless plug for our company. We're a, a local analytics and data consulting company. Been around for uh, over 25 years. Um, won't read the slide to you, but this is the kind of work that we do. Our headquarters is just a couple miles north of here. And uh, we've got some customers here today, and uh, hopefully some future customers, and some, some old friends too. So thanks for coming. So our agenda today is we've got uh, a bookend of keynotes, the opening keynote and a closing keynote. We have four uh, session tracks that are all simultaneous. The, uh, the session tracks are kind of sort of divided into um, projects and case studies for one set of tracks, and the other is basically vendor demonstrations and vendors with their customers talking about the work that they've done together. We'll have a plated lunch in this room, so just come back. We'll have round tables for everybody. Um, sit down style, so you don't have to worry about the buffet or anything like that. We'll bring the food to you. And then, of course, we'll, we'll close the event with a, uh, right after the keynote, there'll be a uh, survey that we'll collect from everybody. There's a bunch of different prizes and raffles that um, you can get involved in throughout the day. So, of course, every conference they're going to ask you to silence your cell phones, so please do that um, so you're not disrupting uh, anybody's conversation or speech. Uh, there's a coat check. You probably already figured that out. Bathroom's right across the hall. Um, we've got a little bit of a consolidated event this year. So normally, we've had the four tracks plus uh, another room all the way on the other side of the venue. We've decided to get rid of that. So everybody's going to be in this space today. So the, the question that I normally get 50 times a day, where is the Mediterranean room? Hopefully, nobody asks me that today because we're not in there today. Um, if you need any help for any reason whatsoever, just please check out anybody with one of these blue shirts, and they'll be happy to direct traffic um, in whatever direction you need it. If you haven't downloaded the conference app already, please do. Um, it's, it's a great app. It's got all the information that you'd want about the conference. It's got the ability to learn about some of the other attendees and communicate with them. And then we've also got in the app um, basically different things that you can do, different activities in the app that you can work through. And then we've got a leaderboard that we're providing um, prizes at the end for who's the most active, the first place and the second place uh, winners for that. I want to thank you uh, or thank our sponsors. Without the sponsors, it would be very difficult for us to pull this event off. Um, spent a lot of time talking through with folks that want to be a part of the event. Um, I meet with them all and, and have great conversations. We're, we're fairly picky, and so you know, we're very proud of the list that we pulled together today. And uh, please do visit all of their booths. Um, each one of them um, has a scanner, and everybody that uh, goes to all nine booths, including our booth, the WIT booth, um, there'll be a $25 gift card for Amazon that we'll be sending to you after the event. So please visit everybody. The vendors will also likely have some of their own um, raffles, so give your business card or get scanned or whatever process they have. And then at the event um, closure today, that we'll do the, the raffles with, for the sponsor stuff as well. So a bunch of different contests. Um, try to make it fun. Try to make it interesting. Please do participate. You know, here's our the list of things that are going on today. Um, I want to emphasize at the end of the day, when we do have the feedback survey, please do uh, fill it out. We do take all of your comments seriously, and we adjust our event every year um, based on feedback. OK, I want to introduce Eric Meyer. Eric Meyer is President and CEO of Sandler EAM Consulting. I've known Eric for a couple years now. Um, I would say that he is a savant level student of the human animal, and uh, he's here to talk today about one of the interesting things that I've, I guess, experienced in my career as an analytics person for a bunch of years, there's a lot of great ideas that our customers and colleagues have. And just for whatever reason, um, these folks have had a difficult time promoting those ideas internally, selling upward to the management chain to get some of those good ideas that are, that are good for them and also good for their companies. And so you know, Eric is going to talk through um, how to help. So without further ado, Eric.
right, are we marked? We're good? All right. Good to see everyone. Good morning. Thank you uh, very much for having me. Uh, as Scott said, my name is Eric Meyer. Appreciations, first and foremost, to Kaid, Scott, uh, Tim, and Aaron, who helps make all of this happen. So thank you all for having me here. I was really looking forward to it. Uh, today is, is kind of interesting. Uh, last week, I was in Switzerland. Uh, I'd been invited out to Switzerland to spend some time with an organization. And I flew for roughly 16 hours to get there and then 16 hours to get back. And then I spent two days with that organization. That was a lot of fun. This morning, I had an opportunity to be here with you guys. So I woke up. I went to my office, which is in the Liberty Center. Does anyone over there, right? Share the parking lot with the Marriott. I walked across the parking lot, and I came here for, for this morning. So uh, I appreciate the convenience of being here today. That's, uh, that's kind of a nice change from last week. And I was thinking, you know, before we kind of kick this off, I, I speak on the topic that we're going to talk about pretty frequently. In fact, later on today, I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to do it virtually to a group of people where I've got a big screen in front of me, and I can't see them, and they can't see me. So this is also preferential. But every time I talk on this topic, I, I kind of switch it up a little bit because there's always a, a nuance to the audience. And I think that that nuance changes. And because it changes, some of how I want to you know, break apart this information should change. So maybe just a quick show of hands. How many of you have a primary responsibility that would include selling? All right, good. So for those hands that went up, you're going to be mad at me for not focusing enough on selling methodology today. right? Uh, how many of you have a primary responsibility that might be more technical in nature? All right, good. All of you will be mad at me for spending too much time talking about selling, right? So just we're on the same page. Somewhere in the middle is a balance. And if we could, again, kind of level set what that is, <clears throat> my organization is, is positioned in a marketplace to help increase the performance of sales teams and sales performance within the companies we work with. Uh, those companies are small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large publicly traded businesses. We'll give some love to this side of the room for a second. And <clears throat> they all have different challenges, right? But even though we kind of start there, what we will typically do is we'll begin on the sales side, because that's kind of the core content or how we're at least seen in that market. And what we'll learn, or what they'll learn, I should say, is that it's really just human dynamics, right? So it's not selling, it's, it's human dynamics. This is the challenge. And so when you're selling physical products and services outside the four walls, uh, there's a human dynamics challenge in making that happen. And when you're trying to promote ideas internally, I think there's a human dynamics challenge that happens there too. So we'll start with the sales team, but by the time we've fully integrated, we're working with operations, we're working with marketing, we're working with human resources, we're working with tech in the warehouse. You know, everyone speaks to each other and everyone's got some ideas they want to promote. And really when I think of selling, if we could just define it this way and then we'll dive in, I have an idea I think is in someone else's best interest to adopt as theirs, and I'd like them to do that. All right? So if we kind of look at it that way, does everyone have a sales function? You should. Otherwise, you're just living a life of listening to other people, and you've got no agency. Right? So <clears throat> there's, there's some really important challenges, I think, too, that I want to try to uncover or unpack in the time we've got. Now, if you could picture it, too, I use Wit as an example. I mean, how many years have we been working together now, Kaid? All right, three or two. I don't know, two coming up maybe on three, and that could turn into 20. There's so much material and information to unpack on this topic. It's almost impo it, it is impossible to do it in 55 minutes in the time I've got left. But we'll hit as much as we can, and maybe if I can encourage you, too, to think about one thing, and this might be a good thing to take away right away. It's easy to come to a conference like this and gain education. I think a lot of people do that. It's different to learn something. So if I thought about what learning something means, it means that you've decided to adopt or change your behavior. So it's not just that you took some notes on stuff, but you took that stuff and you've decided to adopt a different behavior. When you leave, you will do something differently. Right? You will grow by a factor of one. So if you've gotten education, great. I hope that you will learn something. That means you've changed behavior. So maybe when we're, we're spending this time together, we can learn how to, to change your behavior. All right, so with all that said, let's break down. What is the challenge? What is the problem? What is the issue? Well, when people kind of get into this environment <clears throat> where one side feels like they might be on the selling component of a conversation, right? They're trying to push maybe an agenda that they've got or they're trying to get someone else to adopt a belief that they have and, and you know, come on board with their thought process. You've got the sales side over here, whether it's technically sales side or it's just conceptually sales side. And then you've got someone on the other side of the conversation who realizes or recognizes they're kind of playing this buyer role, right? And at some point you might be on one side of that, at some point you might be on the other side. Can everyone picture being on one or the other though? 
right? I, I feel like I'm being sold something, I'm on the buyer's side, I feel like I have a responsibility to convince someone to do something, therefore I'm on the selling side. And so when that happens, it creates a very different dynamic in the way people interact with each other, doesn't it? So maybe we wanna start by just unpacking where does that come from? Because it's a deep problem, I think. So I want all of you to just kind of work your way back in time to however old you were when you were allowed to answer the home phone. Everyone remember the home phone? Right? At some point I need a different example. We'll go with X, it's still relevant. Uh, but if I could picture that, I was probably like five or six years old, I think, when I finally got the chance to do it. And uh, I got some education from my parents who raised me and they said, Eric, you pick the phone up and you say, hi, this is the Meyer residence. Everyone gets some version of that, right? And so with enthusiasm, we're sitting down over dinner. Phone rings, no one was expecting it to come through. I run over to grab it and I say, hi, this is the Meyer residence. And on the other end is my grandma. And so she goes, hi, buddy, how are you? Good, chit chat a little bit. She says, is your mom or dad available? I go, yeah, sure. I go to hand the phone over. Mom, dad, we're fine with it. They chit chatted with Grammy. That winds down, we're back to eating dinner. Five minutes later, the same, relatively same environment reproduces itself. Phone rings again, I run over to grab it because it worked well the first time. So this is the Meyer residence. This time the person on the other end of the line says, hi, is your mom or dad available, right? And I you know, worked the first time, so I go to lean over to my parents and I said, someone's asking for you. They noticed something intuitively that was different though. Anyone know? Yeah, it was kind of obvious I didn't know who it was. Now, if I didn't know who it was, who did they assume it to be? Yeah. Salesperson, right? By the way, I, I hate the monologue, so you guys yell stuff out at me, give me feedback. It's so much easier. I think our time's better spent that way. So they knew it was the salesperson, right? So then they taught you to do something different. They didn't tell you to do this to Grammy. What did they teach you to do to the salesperson? Yeah, all, right? Like, hang up. Is that nice or not necessarily quite polite? Eh, right? Uh, tell them I'm not here. A little conflicting, right? Um, <clears throat> is it fair to say, just in a, in a broad description, what they taught you was treat people with respect, comma, but, until you realize that you are with a salesperson. And then you have the opportunity to do all these other things. You can flat out lie to them, you can treat them poorly, you can be rude to them, we will support you, we're educating you to do it right here, right? Um, and it becomes wildly conflicting. Now you take that message and you bring it forward. Let's say you, you, know, you left today and you wandered over to uh, Somerset, right? And you didn't necessarily need to buy anything, but you're just walking through one of the department stores because they're smart. They, they put them around the outside, right? So you have to park and then walk through one. You want to get to the inside. And so if you're walking through Macy's, you stop for a split second and you take a look at a coat on a rack and the sales associate is you know, courageous enough maybe to come up and ask you if you want any help. What do you say without having to think about it? No, I'm just looking, right? Like there's no cue card for it. We don't have to stop and pause and go, what do we do here, right? Like it just kind of flows through. Now, what does that do to the salesperson? It makes them go away, right? Problem solved. I didn't want to talk to them. I say that, they leave, right? Uh, does the salesperson get much value out of that interaction? Not really, right? And I'd say, yeah, flat out no. But it happens over and over and over again. Now, by the way, is it absolutely true? Like if we're thinking of absolute truths that you did not need help? If, if, if it's maybe, by the way, is it absolutely true, right? Like, no, there's, it's either yes or it's no or it's not true in between, right? Uh, and so we kind of see that as a carry forward from lessons learned in youth. How do we want to interact with salespeople? So it creates this problem. I will get to the slides eventually, Scott. I told you ahead of time. You know, someone on my team always is good enough to put them together. So the visuals that are like hoping that I'll catch up with them, I may. At some point, I'll probably just talk to you for the most part, though. But uh, we'll click to those eventually. So if you could kind of picture, we'll call this thing the buyer system. If you want to take some notes on it, this is what happens when buyers realize that they are involved in what may potentially be a sales conversation, they kick this training in that they've learned and they start to deploy this thing called the buyer system. So step one is they don't tell the truth, right? And is anyone in HR in here? No, good, so we'll call it lie. How about that, that's fair, <laughs> right? Uh, so buyers lie. Now, it doesn't mean that they're bad people when they do it, and they don't do it to be bad people. They typically do it for one of two reasons. Either they've been taught that if you are the buyer in the conversation and you have someone trying to sell you something, if you overshare, it will be used against you. Don't overshare, right? Reason two, and you guys probably run into this pretty frequently, I would assume, they don't know what they need help with. So when they don't know what they need help with, they say, no, thanks, just looking, because what's it get to do to the salesperson again or the sales side? They go away, right? How often do you talk to people that don't know what they need help from you with? 
all the time, I would imagine, right? So it's easier to be dismissive to it because then they don't feel like idiots for not knowing they were supposed to be wanting your help, right? Um, so it's kind of this lie thing. Now, <clears throat> does it end there sometimes? Yeah, right? It's pretty compelling lies and it, it ends the conversation. Sometimes though, the person on the buying side realizes that there may be added value in carrying it forward because they've got someone who's smart, they've got someone who's obviously got some ideas and maybe some intellect and, and information, and so they keep them engaged in the conversation. And they say, you know, instead of just dismissing it completely, maybe you can tell me more about what you were thinking. Tell me more about what you had in mind. Tell me more about what you think we might do here, right? And so they start to ask information from you, and we give it to them, right? Now, what does it feel like as we're oversharing? Maybe like we're making progress, right? Uh, by the way, is that information free? Should it be free? Did it cost money to accumulate? Right? And so when people take things for less than the value assigned to them, what do we call that in every other social setting? You get it right, yell it louder. Stealing, right? So you know, step one is lie, and then step two is steal, or gather free information, because why not? And it kind of turns someone who's well-intentioned into an unpaid consultant. Right? which is a, a tough world to live in. You don't make a lot of money there. And so sometimes we, we end up there. <clears throat> and then they have, I think, another genius attack. So they come back to this conversation. They lied about their true wants and needs. They stole and gathered free information. And they're going to capture as much as they can until they decide to have kind of this moment where they're ready to move on. Not completely, but at least from the interaction. And so there's this, uh, I need to throw like a TM trademark next to it. It's called the spectrum of equivocation. If you've never heard of it before, it's fine, I made it up. But it's, uh, it's yes over here, and it's no over here, and then it's all the other stuff in between, right? A lot of stuff in between yes here and no here. The problem with the spectrum of equivocation is that no is no, fair? Right, but what's all the other stuff kind of sound like if we don't want to hear it the wrong way? We're hoping it's yes, right? Things like looks good. That would appear to sound like a yes, but yes is yes and no is no, right? Uh, often that's just a long road to no. So they'll, they'll pick something from the spectrum of equivocation as step three and share that as a, you know, a progression in the dialogue. But really what it is is it's not telling the truth again, it's lying. So step three is lie again. But this time it's about what's going to happen next, right? So it's a non-committal action towards what we're going to do next. It's not true. It's a false positive. Is this making sense, by the way? Everyone's picturing this conversation, right? And so sometimes they might go back and forth between step two and step three. So they go back to stealing some information because why not? People are willing to give it. And then they go back to lying about what's going to happen next because why not? That's easy. By the way, why do you think people don't just say no when they want to say no? Anyone know? K-N-O-W? We're in the Midwest. Yeah, we're in the Midwest, right? So we've got like, you know, this nice thing going on, right? Um, you know, people don't want to be rude. They don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Sometimes you're not sure you want to say no, a little wishy-washy, right? By the way, who's been with a salesperson who's wildly uncomfortable with the word no and they just think it's an objection to try to overcome? Right? So I think even more importantly, maybe people have just learned, hey, if I say something nice and I don't commit it to yes, but I say it politely, they'll leave. Right? Then we don't have to fight and go back and forth and all that stuff. So they're smart there. Because the fourth step, four, uh, would be that <clears throat> they hide. So after they lie, after they steal, after they lie, uh, they've kind of made a decision. The decision is to move on from the conversation because it's not the top priority, and then they go into hide mode. And so what is hide mode, H-I-D-E? Well, they just kind of disappear from the conversation. If they used to be responsive to it, now they're dismissive to it, maybe not even uh, responsive at all. Right? Anyone recognize that's process? Right? More importantly, by the way, has anyone ever done that to a salesperson, <laughs> including yesterday? Right? Um, where'd you learn to do it? Observation, right? It's an observational system. You watch people, you go, eh, it seems to work pretty well, right? Sales. Yeah, being in sales, right? You gotta learn that on the opposite side, because who's in control? Buyer there, pretty clearly, right? So then on the opposite side, I think we've got another challenge that happens. Um, you know, this one, obviously, again, we've got a lot of technical people in here, but. And I'm curious, to, to be the technical expert that you are, did you have to get an accreditation before you could tell people you were a technical expert? Did you have to get a degree in a, in a certain field of study before you could tell people you were an expert? Right. 
do you have to do ongoing certifications to some degree to continue to be an expert? Right? I think in most technical fields, the answer is typically yes, right? How about sales? Nothing, right? You know, there are so many amateur, god-awful, terrible salespeople wandering around the world right now because there is nothing to keep them out of it, right? Most people enter into sales for the first time because that's where they found themselves on the day, right? There's no accreditation for it. There's no certification process for it. There's no real higher education learning methodology for it. And some universities are getting into it, but it's very, very low on the adoption scale. Anyone who wants to do it just decides to do it, right? And so without that real training background in education, I think often it's learned in a way that's not necessarily helpful, right? We kind of observe, we try to pick up best practices, but it's problematic. Here's what it has a tendency to look like. I'll just kind of model this out, and then I want to give you some version of how I think you might do it as an alternative. Often the first step in trying to sell something is the person responsible for it attempts to qualify the environment that they're in, right? And in attempting to qualify the environment, they're looking often at a technical environment. What's the technical criteria? What's the technical landscape? What's the technical fill in blank, right? And if I could kind of illustrate it this way, is anyone an iPhone user? Just quick show of hands, right? Keep them up if you're a hardcore iPhone guy, right? Some hardcore people. So if, let's say I was selling a Google Pixel, just by way of example. And so I randomly talked to one of these iPhone users and I said, hey, can I ask you some questions? And they were kind enough to say sure. And I said, great. Uh, do you need to use a cell phone? What's the technical answer to that? Yes. All right. So are they conceptually qualified? Not conceptually, we'll get to that. Technically qualified by the first question to use the Google Pixel. Absolutely. All right. And then I say, do you need it to send and receive text message? Yes. Cool. Mine does that too. Technically qualified. Do you like it to take video if that's possible? Yes. Good. Technically qualified. Uh, you know, then I get a little deeper maybe into payment and pricing stuff like, hey, would you like to be able to pay for it every year all in full or do you need to break it up into monthly installments? Monthly installments, great. All in full, we have both options. Technically qualified still? Yes, right? Uh, then I might ask even deeper questions like, is it the same physical phone you've had for the last 10 years or have you actually changed it at some point? And the answer is probably yes, even if it's been iPhone to iPhone, but physical change is probably there. And so I say, great, open to change, right? So technically qualified by all of these questions to buy my Google Pixel. Fair, right? And so we get all these false positives, I think, when we're, when we're asking these technically qualifying questions, but that is often what I hear people doing when they're trying to sell stuff, because if they feel like they've got that environment appropriately prepared, then they put a solution together to that technical issue, and they move to step two, which is to present this technical solution. And so I go to present my technical solution in this example I'm giving you, and I say, hey, here's a Google Pixel. It does all the things you need it to do. And what will I immediately be responded with? I'm an iPhone person, right? It doesn't matter. They are technically qualified, but conceptually completely misaligned to working with that particular product or service. And so we'll say step three is closed, right? At some point, you need to ask people, well, are they willing to you know, go down this path with you? So it's qualifying, presenting, attempting to close or get confirmation. By the way, when you attempt to close and get confirmation to see if someone's willing to go with you, what happens sometimes? No, 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 what happens sometimes? Sometimes they say yes. What happens more often than not? Other stuff, right? Uh, and then we end up in this fourth step, which I would call kind of like chase mode. So if I could picture visually what chase mode looks like, picture like a, a dog owner and a, and a dog playing fetch at a park, right? And so the dog owner's got this tennis ball and they kind of heave it off into the woods, and what's the dog do? And tail wagging, tongue out, it just kind of runs off there to go grab it, picks it up, runs it back, drops it at the owner's feet. <clears throat> no different, I think, in that chase mode of this part of the conversation. Can you get us a reference study? Sure, tennis ball, toss, right? Can you put a demo together? Sure, tennis ball, toss. Can you get us an ROI study? Sure, tennis ball, toss, right? And they will play that game until one of them gets so tired they decide to stop, right? And so we've kind of got a challenge there, I think, which is that the natural tendency of what becomes a selling process for most people uh, is actually pretty broken. And it's not that it doesn't work. I think that's the bigger issue, is that it works just enough to keep you stuck with it, right? And you got to work your ass off. Sorry, I didn't ask in advance if I could use foul language. Um, but you have to work really hard, I think, to do it over and over again. It's, a, it's purely a numbers game at that point. By the way, if you thought about technically qualified 
you know, buyers of your idea or your stuff or your service or your conversations within the walls of your organization or outside of them. If you've got 100 technically qualified people in a conversation, how many of them do you think are conceptually aligned to wanting to actually take action? Maybe 5%, right? And that might even be optimistic in some cases. The biggest problem here is not how we convert the 95% that are conceptually misaligned. That's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is how much time we spend on them, right? Trying to convince them to do stuff, trying to get them to come with us, trying to do this fill in blank, right? There is an endless opportunity always in front of us that we can look at through a lens of abundance. And when we forget that, we look at it through a lens of scarcity and we get locked on things that we know are true technically but with people that are completely misaligned conceptually, right? So we got some problems there. Uh, by the way, does that look familiar, sound familiar? Right, kind of both of these sides together. And again, you know, I heard it over there. Where did the buyer learn it from? They learned it from watching salespeople. I mean, often that's kind of where this comes from. They just, they figured out a better system, right? I can watch these people over here. This is what they do. I want to be in control. I'm going to do this thing over here instead. So it's an issue. Is there a timer up here too? What's it? It's on, your head. it's on my Google Pixel. Hold on. All right, good. I just want to be good at time. So let's uh, let's take the next 30 minutes and kind of break down a, a solution for it. We'll, we'll talk through this in here. I think I can get the slides going. So let's catch them up real quick. Oh, it's stuff. We'll skip through that. Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. So <clears throat> let's say we go back to. Um, we go back to the mall, right? And you know, an interesting thing happens. Do you think that that's, that person in the sales side of the conversation is enjoying their experience? Every day they wake up, they come in enthusiastically, they ask people if they want their help, and they just keep hearing over and over again, like, no thanks, just looking, which is code for screw off, right? Uh, is that enjoyable? I mean, probably not, right? I mean, at some point, they're going to wake up and go, sales sucks, and I'm out, right? Uh, or they will learn maybe how to do things differently. So, you know, again, we were talking about education, we were talking about learning. Learning is adopting new behavior. Maybe here's one of the ones we can start to adopt. So I'll give you maybe tools for the toolkit and, and we'll just apply a couple of them. So I meet that person, I get a chance to teach them new stuff, I set them appropriately up to go back and maybe succeed a little bit better, but I change their talk tracks. So instead of walking up to say, can I help you with anything? Because we know predictably that leads to things like no things just looking. Uh, we teach them to open the conversation by saying, hi, have you been here before? All right, because if they open with that, what's the likely response? Yes. yes or no. Are you likely to lie or tell the truth? You're likely to tell the truth. There's no reason. It doesn't trigger the same kind of mental response in that in environment interaction. And then I want to feed them with the secondary part of that talk track, which is to say, regardless of it's yes or no, I appreciate you stopping in. If you want any help, let me know. And then I turn around and I walk away. So we go back to these conceptual and technical qualified buyers. Who do you think is going to stop and ask me for help? My 5% of conceptually qualified buyers, so I'm going to have less friction there, right? Maybe because some people were on the fence and I didn't do the thing that makes them hate working with salespeople, they might decide, you know, this person seems like a nice enough person, maybe I do want their help. So maybe instead of the five, I get six or seven, right? And I kind of start building off that. But maybe even what's more important, what am I never gonna have to hear again in my entire life? No thanks, just looking. I've completely eliminated the thing I hate most about the profession of selling, right? Just by switching it up a little bit. So we call that pattern interrupts. There's a, a deep psychology and a, and a deep understanding of this that we don't have time to go through, but that's an example of it. So pattern interrupts, you know, we <clears throat> humans are hardwired to do things over and over and over again until there's a reason to do it differently. You know, your morning routine today, unless it was broken by something, was probably similar to the morning routine from yesterday. And you're not stopping to kind of like consciously think through should you or should you not brush your teeth. It's just Here's the process, this is how I go through it, good to go, right? And you will do that until something breaks it. So you go to put shampoo in your hands to put on your head, but you realize there's no shampoo in the bottle. Now what's in control? Shampoo. It has taken over control of your morning routine. Are you still in control of you? Yes, but the shampoo and it being empty has now taken control of your morning routine. You have to switch your pattern. 
And when people have patterns broken, they are likely to default to what has broken it to give control. Right? Doesn't mean they've lost control, but they will default to whatever's broken it to actually give guidance to the conversation or where that path is going to go forward. So the same thing's true in conversation. So if you're not leading with pattern interrupts, you're probably leading by kicking the buyer system into high gear. If you go to someone and say, hey, I've got a great idea, it's not going to cost much, but it's going to be awesome, you are going to create the buyer system very quickly. Right? Just like that seller saying, can I help you find anything? You're going to create no things just looking. Using pattern interrupts is meant to design to break the buyer system. And again, there's a, a deep understanding of that that we've got to go through, but you think about it just on a basic level, it's doing something different. And I'll share one with you because it's kind of built into how we frame this conversation. So we'll say that the first part of the relationship is really bonding and rapport that leads to this thing we'll call upfront contracts. <clears throat> so with bonding and rapport, maybe one of the key elements of using things like pattern interrupts to not start the buyer system is that the buyer system usually comes out of a lack of trust and credibility. Bonding and rapport, if you're really establishing it, means that you have created an environment of trust and credibility. Now, by the way, it's binary, and I think everyone should always think about it that way. We don't sometimes, and that's problematic. So you think about who are people that you want to adopt your ideas. Maybe just picture them for a second. And if, if I said, like, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 is absolute trust and credibility, and 1 is absolutely not, you know, where would you rank that relationship today? If you pick a 7, that's better than a 1, but does that mean they trust you? All right? It's binary. It's either there or it's not. And you know that you have people where you're 10 on a 10 scale. Do they question the same way when you bring them ideas? Do they push back in the same way when you bring them ideas, right? Or are they more willing to have that conversation? So we want to think about a binary. If we don't engage the buyer system, we're doing a better job there. So then we go to this thing we call upfront contracts. <clears throat> now, here's one of these big problems, too. Let's frame it in like two dentists. Anyone gone to the dentist lately? And more hands should go up, you know that, right? Um, it's not a knock. But, uh, you know, let's picture like two different dentists. You got dentist one, dentist two. So dentist one I go to see because I got a tooth that hurts back here, right? And so I go to dentist one and I go, hey, dentist, my tooth hurts. And the dentist looks at it and says, I've done a million of these before. We're going to pull it out, jump in the chair, right? Dentist two, I go to dentist two. I say, my tooth hurts. The dentist looks at it and it says, you know, we might have to take that tooth out. Um, let me kind of walk you through the procedure and, and we can talk through it together. So it'll probably take about 30 minutes. What we'll do is we'll start by numbing the area we're gonna work on. You'll feel a little pinch and then it'll go numb so you won't feel any pain. You might feel some light tugging, but there'll be no pain. When we remove the tooth, uh, you may see a little bit of blood, but we'll make sure we keep it all clean. And then we'll, we'll put some sutures in the wound so that it can begin to heal appropriately. Before you leave, we'll schedule an appointment for you to come back two days from now so that we can take a look at it, make sure it's healed appropriately. We'll take the sutures out, and you know, three days from now, you'll be back to normal. We can get you to solid foods. It'll be like it never happened. Uh, what would you like to do next? Which of the two dentists is likely to create a higher level of comfort? The second one, right? I think on average. Now, for those of you that go, I'll take the first dentist. God bless you, right? <laughs> Have fun. Um, but, but on average, I think, yeah, dentist two is going to create a higher level of comfort there. What did they do differently, though? They explained it in advance. They asked if they wanted to participate. They set in advance how the progression of the conversation was going to go. They didn't hold it back. And I think way too often, and it's a, you know, obviously it's a crazy illustration of it, but we approach a lot of these conversations like dentist one where we lead with our expertise as the reason why you shouldn't question it, just trust me and follow me and get in the chair, right? I've got it, I've done it before, we're gonna do it again, don't worry, right? And it puts a lot of pressure on the person you're saying that to versus dentist two that says, look, this may not even be the right thing for us to do, even though I have a recommendation that you may wanna pull that out, right? But let me walk you through the process, you decide what you wanna do next. And we call those upfront contracts. So the key to upfront contracts is that they carry five elements that I think are pretty critical. One of them is just simply stating the purpose. If you're going to have a conversation about something where you'd like someone to make a decision about doing things with you or not, you know, we should both mutually agree to the purpose of having that conversation in the first place. And sometimes we don't, right? So we want to make sure we've got mutually agreed to purpose. A length of time that's appropriate so that we're not rushing against the clock. If we don't set the right amount of time for a deep dive in a conversation, do we get more or less time than we needed on average? 
I think less often, right? We start taking more time, that puts pressure on both parties, now they start wandering off to other stuff, so are we asking for the right amount of time and committing to that in advance? Understanding their agenda so that we can make sure that time is well spent for them. It's not just about what matters to us, it's about what matters to both parties, so understanding their agenda and expectations, that's the third element. Fourth would be sharing our agenda and expectations to the degree that both parties are comfortable with them, right? And then the fifth one, and this is probably the most difficult one to learn, but the most important part to it, agreeing in advance on outcomes, outcomes being decisions that would be expected to be made in this meeting. Okay? And there are a couple of different outcomes, I think, depending on how you're progressing through adopting someone's idea to becoming your idea or the other way around. One of them may be you decide through the course of the conversation that what you thought was going to be in their best interest to do is not. Anyone ever figured that out as they learn more about an environment they've been asked to, to interact with? And so if that's the case, I think you should always retain the right to say, look, if I find out that I can't help, can I tell you I can't help? We call it no. And then just as true, if you decide that this is not the right thing for us to be spending time on and you don't want to talk about it anymore, would you be comfortable just saying bluntly no to me and we can move on? And then if neither of those two things happen, let's clarify what we're going to do at the end of the meeting today so that we can just agree to do that so we don't have to worry about figuring it out when we get there. And that just might be we're going to schedule another one. It might be we're going to have to bring some other people and create a new agenda, a new purpose, and a new game plan. We'll do that before we wrap up. It's closing in the beginning, so all you have to do is confirm at the end. And that's how you become dentist, too. Now, how many conversations like this do you think start off with two of the three options being we do nothing? Not surprising. Most people don't do that naturally or intuitively. Does that remove or increase pressure for the other party, though? I think it removes a fair amount of it, right? Might say no, might say no. If that doesn't happen, we can agree to yes. Is it more honest, maybe, than most conversations are that start that way? Right? If there's only an option for yes, where do you think people take that pressure wall? Right? They bring it up. So we want to make sure we set the right stage for it. Because that's where we can now get an opportunity, I think, to dig into more of the problem side. So on the problem side, we want to call that this combination of pain budget and decision. So if you're kind of thinking about, again, just as a framework for building a conversation, you know, these are usually the areas that become a little problematic. We're switching it around. So first things first, pain and problems are two very different topics. Often when we're trying to solve problems, we're trying to get our ideas adopted through an organization. We will talk about them from a problem standpoint. We won't get down to a pain standpoint. We'll give you an example. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I asked before on the technical side, is it that they don't know they need help in the way that you might help them understand? I saw a lot of people nod along, right? Because you've got a deep technical expertise. Your audience may not realize the real issue they've got. So the problem they see is not the real problem they have. Is that fair? All right. You know, I mean, we can, we could do a meta version of that. If I ask one of you who got here late, you know, why did you show up late? And you go, well, you know, I didn't wake up this morning on time. Well, that's fine. Why didn't you wake up on time? Well, I didn't go to bed on time. Okay. Why didn't you go to bed on time? Right? Oh, because I mismanaged my evening. Okay. Why'd you do that? Oh, because I mismanaged my life. Right? You know, you, <laughs> eventually you get to pain. Uh, is that a very different conversation and a higher level of emotional attachment? Right? Always. So. I think often we spend too much time trying to fix the problem, and the problem is what I would call IBS. I already started with the foul language. Anyone know what I IBS stands for? Intellectual BS, right? Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Pain is an emotional attachment to an issue that's five, six, seven, ten layers deep. But it isn't typically what we get to in this conversation. We spend way too much trying to solve the issue that's been presented, right, in the way that it's been presented. So I want to encourage you to get down to pain. Now, if you think about pain, too, in this connection to budget, pain must be quantified. There's got to be a numerical value associated to it before we can agree that we've actually gotten to pain. Because people will buy and invest in solutions that cost less to buy and invest in than they cost to keep as problems. Do you need me to repeat that again? Yeah. All right. People will buy and invest in solutions when it costs less to buy and invest in a solution than it costs to keep the problem. If I have a problem that costs me a million dollars a year and the solution costs me 10, I might have a hard time cost modeling that as an, as an investment. If I've got a problem that costs me $10 million a year and a solution that costs me a million, good or bad choice? 
is a much better one, right? Certainly easier, less friction. So we've got to quantify the pain, and there's always quantification to the pain. Again, I think we just don't do it as often as we should, because that can lead us into budget. Uh, so I'll give you a quick riddle. Um, hopefully this will get everyone's brains exploding this morning. If you know the answer to this and you've heard it before, don't ruin it for everyone. But if I've got two items and one of them's a baseball and one of them's a bat, and just kind of think of these two items together, the two of them together are a dollar and 10 cents in value. Dollar and 10 cents in value, baseball and a bat. Now one of them costs a dollar more than the other. What's the cost of each? One of them costs a dollar, and one of them costs 10 cents, doesn't work, right? If you're trying to work that one out, it's a nickel and a dollar and a nickel, all right? So that's an easy math problem. Why is it such a difficult one to do? It's this thing called benchmarking, right? You heard a dollar and 10 cents, a dollar and 10 cents, a dollar and 10 cents, a dollar more than the other. And so our brains benchmark on stuff. And sometimes we don't pay attention to this when we're having these conversations. You want to get stuff budgeted. One of the biggest problems with it is that we, we lean to the solution as the first time we talk money. And so if we start talking money as the solution, what we've missed is quantifying first the problem. So what do they benchmark now as value or relative value? Well, it's the cost of what it might be to budget to solve and fix. So I can defend against that. And that's hard to walk back from. Quantify pain first, use that as relative benchmark value for the budget conversation, it's very different but it's not how it typically happens. So if we think about the budget side too, money is a, an important element of it, but I'll give you an acronym if you just wanna jot this down, if this matters to you guys, it's TEAM, T-E-A-M. So money's a pretty critical element, I think, of budgeting projects appropriately, but it does not matter nearly as much as the following. T is time. How much time is it gonna to take to really work on solving and fixing an issue? And I think more often than not, that may be the bigger problem in your world. Can we mutually agree to that? Effort. Effort is the amount of you know, physical energy or education that needs to be put in to be able to use whatever's created appropriately. Is everyone familiar with the reference shelfware? Right? You know, how much good stuff turns into shelfware because the effort hasn't been appropriately aligned. People haven't been trained, they haven't spent the time to learn it. Right? A is accountability. Do you have a counterpoint who is willing to manage it on their side? All right, we've got two different teams here, maybe your team and their team, again, inside or outside the walls. But if there's no mutually shared accountability, uh, you know, usually the selling side is going to have to take a lot of heavy lifting and responsibility to try to herd those cats on the effort side, and that's problematic. So it's time, effort, accountability, and then M is money, and we want to align money resources, again, to this idea of what do we quantify pain to be. If the money is within the tolerance, it's a good investment. And then we want to get to decision making. So this one's tough. How many times have you been caught off guard or railroaded by someone who has a decision and has not been part of the conversation? But they're influential to it, right? And I think that one's pretty frequent. You know, often we'll ask about who needs to be involved, but we don't ask who besides the people that are currently involved and engaged that are gonna be part of this process. Uh, do you guys remember interrogatives when you were in primary school? It's really all it is. I think for today, I'm gonna to share that one with you. It's the newspaper approach, and it doesn't happen as often as it should. It's a couple of simple words, it's just who, what, when, where, how, and why. And I would really encourage the why part, not a natural part of this conversation, but a critical component to it. Good partnerships challenge that decision authority a little bit, right? And they should ask why. Why are you doing that that way? What's the bigger problem most of the time, too? Is it that they don't know it's a problem and they don't have the resources to buy it, or is that decision process broken a little bit, right? We're not getting access to the right people. It's not the right kind of timelines for making the decisions. I think often that might be the bigger problem. So we want to understand what that looks like. All right, so assuming we've got all that, you know, now hopefully we can, we can kind of build a framework for being able to get our ideas adopted a little cleaner. Let me back up real quick, though. If you have to put a presentation together, and we'll call this the next stage, which is like fulfillment, and we'll say post-sell. There we go. Anyone ever had to put a presentation or a proposal together and it was like wild guesswork, right? Uh, you know, this interrogatives process and plan should actually give you some pretty good insight to it. I wanna see how we're doing again on time. Oh good, I can tell you a story. So I have, uh, I have a side project business that I've been playing with. Um, it's called BarkPo, B-A-R-K-P-O, right? Uh, and we, uh, we compete against Alpo, right? Dog food company kind of a different 
area that I'm interested in. So <clears throat> I, I had a chance to have a sales conversation with the buying team of Pet Supplies Plus. Right? And so I'm sitting there with the, the Pet Supplies Plus buying team. Uh, we used pattern interrupts to break the buyer system, which was good. Right? Uh, we set upfront contracts to create the conversations, which was good. Uh, we understood their pain. They had pain, quantified their pain, uh, made it through and navigated a budget conversation, agreed to time, effort, accountability, and money. And we get to this decision-making start or part of the, the dialogue. So I said to the team, you know, who besides you needs to be involved if the next meeting that we're having is the kind of meeting where we've got to decide whether or not you guys want to buy Barco and put it on the shelves of Pet Supplies Plus? And they said, well, this is the team that can make that decision. All right? I said, cool. Uh, when do you want to get together? So well, we'd like to meet next week. How about Wednesday? Uh, I'd say 1 to 2 p.m. Okay, that works for me. Good. Uh, where do you want to meet? And they said, well, let's meet at the test facility. It's just up the road from here, uh, about a mile up the road. It's okay, makes sense. Test facility works. So in that meeting, Wednesday, 1 to 2, we got an hour. What do you want to hear, see, feel, or experience so it's a good use of your time? They said, well, what we'd like to do there is we'd like for you to bring some samples. We'll set up a you know, taste test. And uh, we've got some test animals up there that'll help us with it. We'll do a bowl full of bark po over here. We'll do a bowl full of alpo over here. And we'll, we'll see which one they like best. And I go, hey, that makes a lot of sense. How do you kind of form conclusions or frame conclusions using that kind of taste test comparison study? They said, well, you know, if they eat the alpo and they don't eat the bark po, then we're not going to buy bark po. Um, I said, well, what if they do the other way around? They go, well, if they eat the bark po and they don't eat the alpo, then we'll buy, you know, buy the bark po. I said, what if they eat a little bit of both, right? It kind of looks like it's equal enjoyment. I said, well, you know, we, we've already got alpo on the shelves. We'll probably do a test run. We'll start there, see how it sells through with bark po. Okay, cool. Why do you do it that way, right? I said, well, we used to make decisions poorly uh, with this buying team. And what we realize is that the consumer isn't really the, the pet owner, it's the animal, right? What they like, the owners buy for them. And so we let them decide ultimately what they want. And I, I totally fake story, by the way, just we're on the same page. If anyone was wondering, like, you know, hey, Eric's got some problems with this Barco concept, we gotta help him out afterwards. I don't have a company called Barco. But I use that just to kind of illustrate what this looks like. So here's what it is without that. Someone who's got the responsibility to get someone else, again, inside or outside, to adopt their idea and bring it through, they're not having that conversation in that way. And here's the problem. That seller shows up to the next meeting with a presentation. It's got some slides in it. It's got some PowerPoints in it. It's got some case studies in it. It's got some stuff in it, right? But what did the buying team want to see The dog eat the food. That's all they cared about, right? And the bigger problem is that they won't be honest most often. They'll be polite. They'll sit there and they'll let you go through all your crap. And then what will they say at the end? Spectrum of equivocation. Pick one of them, right? Oh, well, this is great. Thanks so much. When they really mean no, right? Uh, <clears throat> so just kind of thinking about that. Now, if I had that conversation, I have a pretty good sense, pretty clear sense or picture of what's going to happen at that meeting Wednesday from 1 to 2. This is a pretty clear picture. I've got a pretty clear picture, too, of the decisions everyone's comfortable to make. I just need to know that I can show up with a side-by-side -side taste test there and at least compete against Alpo, and I'm good to go. Doesn't mean I'm guaranteed to you know, get people to say yes, but it does mean that I'm very likely in a position where I will get an answer. And sometimes doesn't that matter more? Right? So then we've got this fulfillment thing. And again, fulfillment's not presenting solutions. It's fulfilling the obligations of the conversation. If you understand pain and budget and decision, your fulfillment should be fulfilling those. Here's how it's going to fix this pain. Here's how it will do it within the parameters of budget we've agreed to, time, effort, accountability, and money. Here's how it will do it in line with your decision-making process and criteria. Right? And if we do it with an upfront contract, we mutually agreed outcomes. At that stage, what's one of the outcomes? The outcome is we have to make a decision to pursue this or not. All right? Because at some point, you have to ask people to say that, don't you? So now that we've gotten there, I want to think of one last piece to it. It's uh, what we call the post sell. Uh, so the post sell, you know, this is a really easy one to miss. Uh, is anyone, now Amazon, I'll pick on Amazon for this. You ever bought anything on Amazon and then unbought it? 
right? And it's easy to just kind of ship stuff back. So you've got two issues there typically at play. When people agree to get started on projects, they may still decide not to you know, pursue. One of them is buyer's remorse. So the decision they've made, they decide to walk back on. That's a problem because they might change their mind. The other one is what we would call vendor vengeance, which is where some competing idea or alternative shows up. And then again, they, they walk back on the decision that they made. And so I think uh, you know, often one of the problems here is if we get excited that we've got green light projects, we don't really want to challenge that decision. What do we want to do instead? Just kind of get going on it, right? I uh, cross my fingers and hope nothing else shows up in between. If you have heard anything that might give you a little bit of cautious pause that what was agreed to was really meant to be agreed to, the post sales are a very critical element. Check it out, right? Check it out. And what I mean by that is test the environment that you're in. I think often the biggest problem with selling, professional selling, is that people are not disarmingly honest, right? They're not disarmingly honest. And I'm not saying so much on the buying side of that conversation, I'm saying on the sales side of the conversation. Because on the sales side of the conversation, if they're not being disarmingly honest, we're really solely focused on getting the other party to do. Buy, right? Just buy and agree. And that's not being disarmingly honest. More often than not, what do you think technically qualified buyers are actually going to tell you? Happens now, anyway. I think on average what you find is that more often than not, the right answer is actually no, right? So if we're not being disarmingly honest and open to the idea that that's actually the best thing to hear because it's probably what needs to be said, uh, we spend way too much time and put way too much pressure on both parties, and, and it's not helpful. All right, so this is what I wanted to cover with you guys today. Hopefully this um, you know, made both sides, sales and technical, unhappy like we started off with, so it couldn't get any worse. But I've got a little bit of time left, I think, to do some Q&A if we want to do any of that. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or comments? Yeah. The last thing you were talking about, are you trying to suggest that professionals, like sales professionals, may not be completely honest with people they're trying to get money from? Not even suggest. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will go so far as to say guaranteed, right? That's astonishing. Yeah. And it's a problem, though, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I'm, I'm on a mission personally. Like, I am on a, a deep personal mission to change that on our walls, disarming the honest conversation, the first thing I want to teach anyone to do is become more comfortable with no. Right? You don't grow by saying yes to more stuff. You grow by being able to comfortably accept or say no to things. Right? Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Anyone else? Thoughts, comments, questions? Yep. That's very good. Absolutely. And it's not in their best interest to not do it. And it's hard. Because, you know, if you say no, what do you think male salespeople are worried they're going to say back? They're going to say, yep, good choice. Let's go with no. Guess what never happens, though, when you start that way? No one ever just says no because they don't know what to say no to yet, right? It just, but it opens up the idea that we can do that, and that's fine. Now the comfort's there, right? We can talk about this. Awesome. Anything else? All right. Well, I know at that point that means it's time to go. So I want to thank you guys. If I could close with anything, uh, you know, spend the next however much time you're going to be here. Spend that time learning and adopting new behavior. And if you can do that, I think that this is always a good use of your time. So thank you for spending it with, this, uh, with me this morning. I appreciate it. And hopefully you learned something.